先ほど申しましたように自然現象には本質的な不確定性があるにもかかわらずそういうものあってもですねそういうものはあたかも内かのごとくやれるだこれは非常に確率の的な手法を非常にうまく使っているということです例えばそういうことのどういうことものを使ってその制限能力が大きく確定な自然という部分があるにもかかわらずそれをあたかも確定しているように使っていくことができるようにまあ奥さんに話してもよろしいけどもっとよくわかるのは選挙の時を見ますけど選挙の時には別に選挙速報ってあるわけですね当選確率ってことやるわけですよねまだ全部投票し終わらんうちに当選確率って非常に不思議ですよね当選確率なら当選確率と言わなくて当選と出るはずなんですそこそこ確率と出るっていうのは不確率だから確率ですどういうことかその意味は何かって言いますとどれぐらいの確率か分かりませんけど非常に 100% に近いいろいろ推定をいたしましていろんな情報を集めまして推定いたしましたまだ投票終わってないけどですまた投票してもですねこれ当選しない確率は非常に小さいだろうとどこまででやるか知りませんよ 95% は 99% のその辺は私には分かりませんけど非常にもう位置に当選の確率非常に位置に近くなっているところで当確とか出すわけですねだから当確はたまには外れなくてめったに外れなくてだから当確なんです我々人間が生きていくというのは本当はですね毎日毎日生きていけるというのは毎日毎日当選確率が起きてるわけですよねそうですよね今日,今日も自動車に引かれなかっただから私に引かれなかったから1個金あるんだよ。しかし、明日引かれんかとそんなこと分しかし、まあ、多分引かれんやろと。で、明日は行きながらかどうか。行きながら確率は非常に大きい。その時は当選確率。そういう状況の中をずっと生きていると。そういうもんですよね。昔、お昔、その、もう中国では、この老子とか当時とかいう、大変この面白い人があるわけです。人間というのはあんまり賢くないのはよろしい。バカの方がいいってなこと言ってそういうこと言ってから、どうして自身は自分はバカだと思ってなかったに違いないですよね。そこに矛盾がしてねやろう。それからこういうこと、老子はこういうこと言ってるんですね。知るものは言わず、言うものは知らず。そこは老子の回答が残ってんだよね。そう言うとったんですよ。そういう矛盾があるけれども、明らかな矛盾があるけれども、しかし、非常にそれはですね、その当時はどうであるか知りません。今となってみて、これからの世界というものを考えてみますと、恐るべき真理が含まれているわけです。つまり、いらんことをしたからです。一生懸命に科学など進歩させたから、人間はこんな偉いことになるじゃないですか。自分たちがお互いに人間とよくそこの底まで知るということを恐れなきゃならない。As we all know, Hideki Yukawa's father was Chinese historical geography teacher Takuji Ogawa, and his older brother, with whom I read many books, is ancient Chinese historian Shigeki Kaizuka. Then there is Yukawa's younger brother, Tamaki Ogawa, who specialized in Chinese literature, so of course, Yukawa was not only familiar with writing calligraphy, but also Chinese literature, Chinese thought, or more broadly, Asian thought. And was a fan of Chinese poetry since he was a boy. I think he was taken aback by Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu's so called Taoism. Following this, Hideki Yukawa first theorized about elementary particles, and I think it is evident in how he focused on the Lao Tzu Chuang Tzu thought. Found deep within Basho's haikus. As Hideki Yukawa was skillful at tanka, which is short lyrical poetry, where in the middle of its profanity there is what one might call the measure, which is a measure of the meanings that are sung. And of course, many of the songs grasp his own true feelings. Take the following song, for example. 
walking along the line of defeated warriors, looking for a brother, longing to see him alive. A dog crouching, a frog croaking, wandering down a road of darkness and shallowness. An elderly lady shows me to a deserted room on a silent tatami mat, a Martin Poops. So over time, Hideki Yukawa advanced to the third high school of Kyoto University, or what was known as the third high school back then, and despite, of course, having an interest in science and physics, he kept reading Kitaro Nishida. Also, around the time of Yukawa's entrance into the third high school, Nishida was lecturing weekly on introductory philosophy, which would go on to become Nishida philosophy. And Yukawa gained an interest in his lectures, as well as those of mathematician Kiyoshi Oka, in differential and integral calculus. What I thought was amazing about Hideki Yukawa was, aside from his scientific results, how the East and science and his father's influences, as well as his rivalry with his brothers, allowed him to read Tanka, write calligraphy, and tie it all back to science. I get the feeling, to put it another way, that as a scientist, Yukawa could pick up on things that ordinary scientists would not have realized. One instance of this was Hideki Yukawa's strong interest in Buddhism, when he would ponder about what Buddhism was. This being a vital part of living in Kyoto, it was amazing that Yukawa could see that his views of Buddhism, or science and mathematics, were missing something and that this meant there was something lacking within himself. On the occasions that I visited the late Yukawa's home, I would inquire into his thoughts on Buddhism. As written by Hideki Yukawa in his later texts, he basically pondered many things such as what was missing in his own Buddhism theories, how his perception of Buddhism was limited to impermanence or Jodo Buddhism. It was enhanced by Honen or Shindan as parts of Japanese Buddhism, which led to the concept of Namu Amida Buddhism and Jodo. Yet he took another look at Buddhism and found a different Buddhism, like Zen, which was nothing new to Hideki Yukawa since he had already heard of it in Kitaro Nishida's lectures. But there was also esoteric Buddhism. There was something quite special about esoteric Buddhism as a part of Japanese Buddhism. And despite it being ignored in the Meiji era, Hideki Yukawa focused his attention on Kukai, as he believed the esoteric Buddhism as a train of thought within the Japanese way might be a highly unique part of how Japanese people think. It would be strange for Jodo Buddhist scholars to suddenly turn to this point of view of Kukai it would not be easy for them. For those practicing Zen, it would be difficult to move on to Jodo, as well as Kukai. But as a scientist, Hideki Yukawa constantly pondered what was lacking within himself. This engrossed him. He went through the ingenious works of Kukai to find what was lacking within himself, and while immersing himself in Kukai, he felt something was missing in European logic and logos, as he studied theoretical physics, science, and of course, most importantly, logic. Due to this dissatisfaction, he came in steady contact with and focused on the philosophies of a Japanese intellectual named Bayan Miura, who would be known as a scholar of reasoning following the Mid-Edo era. And Yukawa set out to discover what was missing within himself through Japanese thought, Buddhism, and logic. For quite a while, I had forgotten Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu's philosophies. Four or five years before, I recalled studying Chuang Tzu for a moment while thinking about elementary particles. 
then I thought within the elementary particles there must be undifferentiated parts among the various elementary particles that have not been differentiated. At that time I thought if there was any word that I knew that described this, it would be Hume. Normally, a theoretical physicist would not apply Hundun in such a case. There was a time when I would ask the late Hideki Yukawa about his theories of measurement. In measurement theory, you need at least one photon to be able to see the smallest particles, which means you need to shine the smallest light on the smallest particle in order to see it. And in fundamental measurement theory, this means the smallest particle itself is disturbed by the smallest light, and therefore unidentifiable. However, I took this to mean that science will not progress any further, and when I approached Hideki Yukawa with this problem, he said the following. It depends on how you view the difference between what you see and what you do. If you stay focused on that difference, science will cease to progress. Nothing will happen. What you see with, what you plan on seeing with, is what is important. What you have is here and what you see is over there and you have to do both. When you do, you have an idea of what it is you have and you see when you are looking. For example, if you are looking at coffee or a woman or that tree over there, if you do not think it's a tree, then it's not. And if you look more ambiguously, it's a town. So regardless if you are looking here or over there, with what you regard both respectively act together. And you need a science that continuously includes both of the ideas. With this, he told me that a new theoretical physics must aspire to this. And after that, he wrote this tanka. Be land and sky, a voyage or lodge, birds and humans come and go. <laughs>